everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Alana Greenberg. I'm the Senior Product Manager for Well Architected. Hi, everyone. I'm Samir Kopal. I lead Product and Engineering for Well Architected. Awesome. So before we go ahead and get started, how many of you are familiar with Well Architected or know what it is? Show of hands. OK. Love that. Great. So um, as some of you know, the Well Architected framework and tool is really helped to, meant to help you ensure that you are building your systems and best practices in the cloud um, in a way that makes sense and you're following best practices, right? And so as Werner says, everything fails all the time. So plan for the future and nothing fails. And that's really where Well Architected can come in. So. Um, when you think about how you build and manage your systems and applications in the cloud, you should be asking yourself, are you well architected? We hope that today we can provide some guidance on you know, how to actually implement well architected and scale it into your organization. So back in 2012, there was an outage with one of our most popular services, which impacted some of our customers. However, we realized that there were some customers who were actually not impacted at all. So we wanted to understand why. And what we found was that those customers that were not impacted actually were following a set of certain best practices consistently. So we went out to understand, OK, how can we share some of these best practices that these customers were following, as well as the insights and data that AWS had, and share that more um, broadly with our community and our customers. And that's really where Well Architected was born. So as some of you know, Solutions Architects, or SAs as we call them, then started providing AWS best practice guidance for architecting in the cloud across operational excellence, security, reliability, cost optimization, and performance efficiency. This resulted in a collection of white papers, which eventually became the first official AWS Well Architected framework. So from there, essays continued to help customers implement those best practices found in those white papers. And over the years, we launched with AWS partners to help provide customers with that more hands-on guidance for actually implementing and understanding best practices. And then in 2018, we actually created the Well Architected Tool. So the Well Architected Tool was created to give you a self-service way to actually learn, measure, and improve your workloads using the Well Architected Framework. I'll go into the framework and the tool in just a few minutes. Since then, we've really focused on making sure that we're updating the well-architected framework as well as the tool to meet the needs of our customers. So in 2020, we launched a full set of APIs, which helps you integrate your well-architected best practices into anything that was existing already, like your systems and dashboards. Then we started implementing customization features, like being able to mark best practices and questions as not applicable. This really came from understanding that not all best practices or questions are applicable to every single workload. And so that was impacting what risk we were giving you after you did the well-architected review. Last year, we implemented and launched the sixth pillar of the framework, the sustainability pillar, as well as custom lenses, which actually allows you to bring in your own best practices into the tool to use as an overlay to the well-architected framework. Samir will go into details about custom lenses a little bit later on. Most recently, we also launched an integration with Trusted Advisor and Service Catalog App Registry. And really, that helps you provide context at a resource level to help you increase the speed of your workload reviews and help save you time when doing a well-architected review. Samir will also touch on that a bit later on. So diving into the well-architected framework a little bit more. So this framework has really been developed through years of feedback and insights from our customers. It includes a set of questions and best practices across six pillars, as well as design principles, including operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and as I mentioned most recently, sustainability. Within those questions, there are various best practices that should be implemented to help you evaluate and maintain the health of your workloads. The Well-Architected Framework is really that set of foundational best practices that will help you think about how you're actually architecting in the cloud. 
And with the introduction of custom lenses, now you can really expand upon that foundation and make those best practices unique to your organization. So custom lenses is meant to enhance the well-architected framework and allow you to really focus on what's unique and important to your organization. Things like governance requirements or operational needs, anything internal to your organization that you want to bring into the well-architected tool to help you keep track of all of your architectural best practices in one place. So speaking of the tool, this is really a self-service way to help you actually review the well-architected framework and those custom lenses that I was talking about. It's really intended to be a continuous and iterative process to help make sure, sure that your teams are always improving upon your architectures. You define your workload, you answer all of the questions and all of the best practices within each of the pillars, and there's risk identified based on what you've answered. Then we give you an improvement plan and step-by-step -step guidance on how you can actually remediate some of those risks. Similarly, you can also upload your custom lenses into the tool and review in the exact same way. Custom lenses allows you to create your own pillars, questions, best practices, helpful resources, as well as improvement plans. And so really, there's major benefits to using the well-architected tool. First, Identifying your risks early and often helps ensure that you're building your architectures correctly from the start. This will help you mitigate risks early and often in your development process. Being able to really document your workload decisions and trade-offs that you may have to make over time will not only help you keep track of those, but also make sure that all of the stakeholders that are working on that workload are understanding why those decisions were made. Lastly, the iterative process helps you understand how your workloads have been improving over time, and you can see progress as you save milestones in the tool. So when we think about well-architected as a whole, there's really three components that work together. The content, the tool, and the data. So the content is the framework, the helpful resources, everything that we've talked about included in the well-architected framework, and now your custom lenses. Then we have the tool. So the well-architected tool helps you carry out those framework reviews as well as your custom lens data. And then you get the data. So the data is all of that combined into what decisions you've made, what your risks are, any you know, notes that you've taken to really help you understand how the content and the tool are integrated into your organization. So as you can see on the screen, there's many different ways that content, tool, and data overlap. And that's really where you can scale well-architected into your organization. So I will pass it off to Samir to talk a little bit more about how you can actually integrate well architected at scale. Thank you, Alana. All right, so one of the things that we always hear and we speak about it a lot at Amazon is you know, good intentions don't work, right? And a lot of us here have been in positions before where we all want workloads to be architected correctly. We want, you know, that we take care of failure and we take care of incident management and all of those things. And those are conversations, but they never really translate into actual mechanisms, right? So here we are to talk about how we can go ahead and create a mechanism that works. And that's called the well-architected way. Um, just to quote, good intentions never work. You need good mechanisms to make anything happen. And that's what we're here to talk about. So how can I implement well-architected for my organization? That's a question I get very frequently. Like, it's great, I can use the framework, I can read about it, I can do it on a single workload, works great. How do I implement this across? And one of the key things is, how do you use it? So there are three aspects to it. There is learn, measure, and improve. Uh, when we talk about learning, that's the first thing that you want to do. You want to learn what well-architected is why well architect is important, when to do the review, why you need to do the review, right? Uh, these are best practices that are learned through incidents that AWS has had, uh, through learnings that we have from our customers, and we've combined this into this framework. So there's a good aspect of saying, you know, we've done this before, we've failed at it, we've learned, and we've now provided guidance. Like Alana was just pointing out, the outage back in 2012 was what prompted this. It's how did some of our customers not get impacted by an outage. So the key thing is learn. Teach your teams about that. And we get into a little bit of details there. Um, sorry, going back. Um, measure, now what does measure give you? Uh, by just show of hands here, how many people here are part of teams where each team in your organization does its own measurement of workload health? Like everyone that works in a silo. Yes? All right, some of you. Uh, so there's no standard way to measure your workloads, right? A lot of times when you look at it, people will be like, oh, I, have, I run this audit, 
I have five high risks or four high risks, but there's no consistent way. What Well Architect gives you is this de facto standard, right, where you can start measuring consistently across your organization. And then it gives you improvement plans. It tells you how you can move from, you know, this is the current state of my uh, workload to where I need it to be, and it's an iterative process. Well architected is a point in state time, or point in time state of your workload, right? What does that mean? That essentially means that today you can say, I've done everything I can, I have no risks. You deploy another change, and you went from being multi-AZ to single AZ, and that no longer is sufficing your needs, right? Your operational goals are not being met, you don't have enough failover, there's a whole bunch that can go wrong. So how does Well Architected come into all of this? Is by looking at those improvement plans, having a continuous improvement process where you're constantly evaluating any change that you make to your architecture to say, did this change the state? Let's talk about what Well Architected actually has. So we went from a very foundational structure of saying, here are some of the, the high-level overview of the best practices we've learned. And those were organized in four pillars to begin with, then we added operational excellence, and we added sustainability over a period of time. We've changed some of these best practices. So we've talked about, you know, a lot about how you can optimize for cost, right? There has been changes on reliability recently with a lot of, like, you know, resiliency and reliability is a big topic. So we've added some best practices around that. So it's constantly evolving, but this is the foundational layer of what you should be talking about, right? Then you move into what we call AWS well-architected lenses. What are lenses? And, and this is where you're moving from this general foundational layer to being more specific to your workloads. These are lenses like we have lenses for compute, uh, analytics, gaming, right, a whole bunch. And what that does is it, that adds another layer on top for you to get a little more specific. How do you go from this general, I should encrypt my data at rest, to what do I do for a workload that's specific for gaming? And that's where the well-architected lenses come into play. And then what we recently introduced last year was called custom lenses. Now, a lot of us are part of organizations that have also learned your best practices, have a lot of Cloud Center of Excellence teams that allow you to go ahead and learn and share those best practices in different ways. A lot of teams have their own tooling that they've built. right? So these are what you can now convert into custom lenses and bring it to the well-architected tool so you don't have five different places that you're tracking the health of your workload. And that becomes critical because now once you start seeing everything in a single place, you can make optimal decisions on what you need to do. So that's where you go from being more general to more specific. As you become more specific, you can create custom lenses. Uh, you can take the well-architected white papers, the lenses like uh, analytics, that you can convert into custom lenses as well. You can create your own flavor of it. Um, here's what I call the well-architected way. Uh, what it needs is inputs. It needs a tool. How do you build adoption for the tool and the usage? How do you go track those improvements, update the tool, and that cycle goes on, and what are some of the outputs that you get? And we get into each one of this as we go. And this is essentially the mechanism I'm talking about. A lot of times when you are looking to implement a well-architected way in your organizations, you're looking at something that can scale. You're not looking at this applies to one workload, and well, it applies to three, but it fails when you try to apply to four. It seems like it's shoved down to people. Right? And you'll see a lot of this come up when you know, some of our customers get on stage and talk to you about how they've implemented this. Right? So let's talk about inputs for a little bit. Why are inputs so important to this whole process? You need to understand why you're doing the review. Um, what is the priority? It's not a checklist. It's not an audit. The reason it is not an audit or a checklist is because what you want to do, and going back to a few slides, you want to learn. Right? You don't want your teams making the same mistake over and over again. That's what happens when it's a checklist or an audit, is your teams are not as aware of what they need to do, because it's like, I checked the box, they asked me to encrypt data, I did it, great. You want this to be more about the learning process. So that's why it's important to understand why you're doing the review and help your teams understand why you're doing a review. One of the reasons could be, hey, we had a recent security incident, and we want to make sure that this doesn't happen again, so the focus on the security pillar is higher, and your teams understand what they're doing and why they're doing that. It could be, well, we want to make sure that we follow a certain standard, and that standard is you know, going by the well-architected um, guidelines. That's another reason you could go ahead and do that. The other thing you want to do is work backwards from your customer. So when you're doing the review, you're looking for a certain outcome. Right? And that could be your internal teams, that could be your external customers, so it could be about, we want to increase our performance for the, you know, 
the tool that we have out there or the service that we are providing for our customers. That's a good way to think about saying that's why we want to do the well architecture review. The other thing could be where we want to make sure our operational load is reduced, so our internal teams that are constantly deploying, monitoring, alarming on things, that is reduced. So you have to understand why and what those needs are from both your internal and external customers. Um, I would also say reference the well-architected white papers. The reason for that is there is a lot more detail that it goes into. It tells you a lot about the value, the why, how did we come up with this process. So those are really good tools as inputs for your teams to learn why well-architected is such an important thing in order to maintain workload health. Let's go into the tool. Now, when I say the tool, immediately the first thing comes to mind is the AWS Management Console, the well-architected service. Yes, that's the first thing, but there is APIs around there, right? So let's talk about the console. So how can you use the console as something that your teams can use? So very simple. Uh, a lot of our customers use centralized accounts. Create a central account because it's a free-to-use, completely free-to-use service. Create a central account. You can go ahead and ask every other team that's doing a, a review to share with that account. So your central team can look at a portfolio view of all the risks that you have across the board and not just a single workload. A great example of that is when you're looking at a security risk that goes across 17 different workloads, you realize this is one service. This is authentication and authorization service that we built, uh, which we, if we fix, it fixes all the high risk issues that all these other workloads have. So you're starting to see a portfolio view. Right? That's a great way to do it, where the tool allows you to go in and share this workload that you've created with other accounts or this central account. A lot of our customers do that with central accounts. Um, the second thing that you can use the console for is it generates reports. So you can use reporting, like you could use that for your uh, ops meetings that you happen to have weekly, monthly, week, or you know, quarterly. Uh, a lot of our customers use that as for budgeting, so they go in and take a look at it and say, here's the risks that we have, here's the cost that it's gonna take us to fix this risk. So they've gone ahead and actually used this for funding as well. So you can use a lot of these features out of the console. Now, as I understand, a lot of us also have tooling that we've built, right? So we already have our own management and governance processes. We have third-party systems that we use uh, that we're tracking our uh, risks in. The APIs are a great way to integrate your well-architected findings into those tools. Or the findings from those tools can help answer some of the questions or update the answers of those questions in well-architected as well. So that gives you the ability to customize, build those features on top. An example that I'll share around API usage is there are some customers that we work with who have this thing where they say, what you call a medium risk is actually a high risk in our business context. So we are gonna use your API and every time you return that as a medium risk, we're gonna change it to a high risk. So when they show it in their dashboard, it's shown as a high risk. So you can go ahead and tailor and customize the experience to your, uh, to your users. Workload definition. Um, why is workload definition so critical? Today, when you ask somebody what a workload is, you get a vague answer, and three people in your same team can tell you three different answers for what, that, what they think a workload is. Well, Architect gives you a structured way to define that workload. It'll ask you things like, what's the name of the workload? which accounts does it span, what regions does it sit in, right? Um, it has a very important field, actually, I think it's super important, it's called review owner. A lot of times you have people in the organization who go, I don't know who to talk to about this workload, right? I don't know who to reach out to. When you look at the review that has a review owner, that's a point of contact. That's where you can start talking about these things. You can look at who did the review, right? A lot of times when you go back uh, and you look at why trade-offs were made or why those decisions were made, you realize you have no idea because you don't know who did it. So those things, are, those, that metadata is extremely important to capture when you're talking about workload information. And the well-architected tool does that for you. Um, documented decisions. How many of you here have been in meetings where you don't know why a decision was made and by whom it was made? How many times you sit in architectural reviews and go, I have no idea why we did this? Right? I've done that a million times. And I'm like, why did we do this? Right? And looking back, and I'm pretty sure people who look back at the code I've written go the same way. It's like, I, why would somebody do that? Right? And back then, that was my only option. That was a trade-off that I made. There is no documentation around it. What Well Architected gives you is the ability to make sure that you add that documentation in there. Right? So you can say, we're trading off cost for high performance. We're trading off cost for high reliability. 
right? So you can say this risk in cost is something that we are ready to accept and acknowledge because of these reasons. So when somebody else is looking at it and saying, I don't know why we provision so many servers, right? They know now. So it, that's a byproduct of having a well-architected review is this historical decision making that happened that nobody knows of. And then I talked about the consistency it gives you, right? So now you're measuring everyone across the same scale. So now you know where those risks are, what those risks look like. Now adoption, um, how do you actually have these teams adopt, right? One way, shove it down their throats. Like a top level mandate, just go do it. Doesn't work, right? Uh, so I always tell people you should try a phased approach. A phased approach means pick a few critical workloads that you think are gonna benefit from doing the review, where you're starting to see a lot more issues come up, where you see operational issues, where you see security issues happening. Go pick those, start using those, start doing reviews for that, and you'll start seeing the value that they bring. And once that value brings, you set that wheel spinning, where you have a lot of other teams saying, I wanna do this too, because there is value. And those strategic workloads are key, because you can immediately see those impacts. So that's what I'd say is determine a phased approach to scale those reviews tailor the guidance using custom lenses. What I mean by that is, you know, if I give you 60 questions to answer on a super high level, right, it's not gonna be as valuable, right? It's great when you're starting off on a new workload, if it's a legacy workload, which has a whole lot of complexity to it, you want to tailor it. You wanna make it as prescriptive as you can. So you can go in and say, you know, I'm gonna skip three questions across the well architect framework, but I'm gonna introduce seven questions on a custom lens, which are a lot more specific to what we are building and what we are doing. It could be industry specific, it could be technology specific, uh, it could be that particular workload specific, right? So you can build out those custom lenses. Uh, collaborate across teams, uh, that helps, because what happens if you have one person sitting and doing the entire review, you're going to struggle. That person has to know everything across your six pillars, and they most likely don't. So collaborate, build teams out that can take, hey, there's a security team that'll do the security review, there's a team that'll do sustainability, there's a team that'll do performance, and a team could be one or two people, they could change, but you're collaborating. And there are a lot of features in the tool that you can use to collaborate. Um, going to organizations in a bit, um, I talked about custom lenses. Um, now organizations, so we integrate with AWS organizations. What that does is, so all these things I was talking about before, is share the review, uh, share those lenses, right? Uh, you can share it with an organization. So now you can create those organizations, those OUs within your departments, and then start sharing them, right? So everyone can collaborate. The central teams can start seeing those dashboard portfolio views that I was talking about, and now they're seeing a broader picture, right? So use that integration that we have. It helps you prioritize where to invest. So think level up and think about when I'm looking across a portfolio, I'm gonna start thinking of, oh wait, we have massive cost issues across the board. What can we do? Can we have a team look at how we are spending across AWS, right? What are some of the quick changes that we can make? What are some of the changes that we can make over time? So those are things that are gonna be important in terms of what you prioritize. Um, labs, a lot of us are scared to go in and try something new in, you know, in the production environment, and I think that's a good thing. Right? Uh, labs are a great way, we have well-architected labs that you can go in and test it out. You can try it, you'll realize what the effort to value ratio is in terms of if I was to do this, how much time will it take? Because a lot of times that I get a question is, great, I know what I need to do, but I don't know how much time or effort it's gonna take me to do that, right? I probably understand the value I'm gonna get out of it, but how do I know? Labs are a great way to go test those things out. It's like a sandbox, build it out, test it, now you know what that effort is gonna look like. Um, I just put an example here in terms of, you know, value to effort. All right, and then the improvement piece of it. Um, as you build these improvement plans, it's very critical. So the first part is we learned what we needed to do, then we scaled that out, we measured where, where our problems are, and the important part is to actually go improve it. And as I mentioned earlier, the improvement doesn't come from, uh, you know, it's not an overnight thing. It's like, here are all the issues that you have. I cut Jira tickets for all of this, Let's get these resolved by the end of the month and we're all good. Doesn't work, right? So you need to start prioritizing. You should integrate with your ticketing systems, cut the priority tickets first, have people go address that, then give them a nice set of priorities so it's continuously improving the health of your workload in the order of priority that works for you, right? And then look at the, the reports that you're generating that help you track where you are in that journey, right? So you are trying to see, it's like your credit score, right? 
Can you go from 300 to 800? No, it builds over time. It's exactly what you want to do, right? You want to slowly improve to a point where it is 800. And not everything is going to be 800. You're going to have workloads that will have certain things that you have compromised or certain things that you have traded off for one or the other, so you'll have risks there. But at least you know of those risks, you're aware of those risks, and you're tracking those risks. Um, what are some of the outputs that you get out of it? A de facto standard, um, as I mentioned earlier, consistency across the board, a central place to look at those reviews. Cost optimization. In today's economy and world, we, we need to look at how we can optimize for that cost, right? When I say cost optimization, it's not just the spend that you have on your resources in AWS, it's also how you manage your teams. Once you start looking at those risks, you can start looking at how and where the resources can be applied within your organization to address these risks, right? And that'll give you a good sense of optimizing your workforce. And then I want to talk lastly about this integration that we just launched earlier this month. Uh, it's with two services, Trusted Advisor and Service Catalog. Um, it's App Registry. So Trusted Advisor is, uh, for people who are not aware, Trusted Advisor is a service that allows you to check your resources for best practices. So it tells you what best practices are uh, across your resources. What we've done is map those best practices back into well architected. So now when you go into the tool, you can see what checks are failing. It's a good start. It's a good baseline for your, for especially when you're looking to say, what resources should I look at? Where do I start? It gives you those checks, get you right there to say, these are your resources, these are accounts, go start here, right? So you start looking into those to begin with. And then the service catalog integration is with App Registry. Uh, app Registry is a good way to start looking at workloads or apps as one unit, right? Today we talk in terms of accounts and, and uh, resources. Uh, what we want to do is start thinking in terms of workloads. So when I tell you an EC2 outage, you're not running across to say where all is EC2 used. You have an application or a workload that you can look at and say, oh, these are five systems that are impacted, because that's critical for you. From a customer standpoint, what you need to know is to say what applications are impacted, not what services or resources are impacted, right? Because what your customers are using is applications. So that's very critical. Uh, what this integration does is it maps your well architected review to an application in App Registry, so you can always reference the review. And with that, I'll uh, bring um, Matthew and Allison to talk about uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance and how they were able to use well architected. Thank you. Oh, last slide. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Dorian, and I am a senior solutions architect at Liberty Mutual Insurance. And for those who have not heard of Liberty Mutual, we are a global property and casualty insurer protecting everything from cars to homes to businesses. And for those who do know us, you've maybe seen our adverts with our Liberty Emu and our quite lovely jingle. And last year in tw at reInvent 2021, we spoke about how we have created a culture of innovation and experimentation all aimed at supporting our evolutionary architectural strategy. How do we rapidly deliver business value in a well-architected way? And with that in mind, we do have 4,000 plus technology employees. So ensuring that well-architected is well-adopted across your organization becomes very important. So with that, we're going to tell our story today from two lenses. We're going to talk about well-architected at the enterprise level and well-architected at the team level. So for any initiative to work uh, at this scale, we wanted to ensure that we gathered momentum across all leaders and all employees. And we wanted to ensure that we had an enterprise-wide initiative that focused on the well-architected enablement, but most importantly, the adoption. So we made sure that we had representatives throughout the organization. So we scarred, went through every corner of Liberty Mutual Insurance, and sure we had representatives from every area and we wanted to ensure that we give them dedicated time and effort and the capacity to ensure that this is you know, a success. So with 4,000 employees, uh, technology employees, we wanted to ensure that we knew how to engage the audience. So we knew from our previous experience of well-architected core constructs, from our well-architected pattern starter kits, that education is key. So we wanted to ensure that we had centralized guidance and support, and this was all focused on easy onboarding, discoverability, and finding out of all of the resources, really targeting that barrier of entry to lower that down. We wanted, again, to take the excellent resources that AWS have and supplement it with our own 
enterprise LM context. A great example of this is the WA Well Architected Lab that Samir just touched upon. We've also created our own supplemented education course that takes into account our own ecosystem and how to, uh, to accelerate that even faster. And we now have a definition of our own engineering excellence. You know, we look at things like door metrics, you know, our, our product lens, our customer, and we have woven in well architected as one of the core pillars to how we build in Liberty Mutual Insurance. With the audience in mind, we now wanted to ensure that we are measuring our process our progress towards our best practices. So of course capturing our maturity metrics. We wanted visibility into our lenses, the usage across them, all of our risks. Uh, and ensure it's really being used and justifying that value we're looking for. And we wanted to take everything that we've learned and use, that, use those learnings to create tailored education and enrich that enterprise resource suite that we have, our knowledge base. And of course, iteration, iteration and learning is, is key. So we went through uh, incremental pillar by pillar rollout. So we went through base guidance, what is review, pre-review pre guidance, post-review guidance, and went through our pillar by pillar, starting with operational excellence, security, and went through that way. And that allowed us to have faster feedback cycles through each stage, uh, and that influenced our own well-architected roadmap. So just looking at some insights and metrics so far, we've had 700 reviews since 2020, and in 2022 alone, we're running at about 10 to 20 per month. Speaking about the lens breakdown, we have 50% of those 700 all focused on our serverless lens. I think that speaks volumes to how much we value serverless architecture within Liberty Mutual Insurance. We have now started to delve into our data privacy by design, and this is our first uh, customer or custom lens that we'll be looking at. And then it also gives a bit of insight into our pillar of gravity. You know, we can see here that operational excellence, operational excellence is quite a popular pillar followed by security, reliability, and things like that. And we are able to look in a bit, bit further, look at our risks, look at the categories of risks, and we can take all that information and keep that flywheel effect better in our resources. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Alison to talk about the team. Thanks, Matthew. So I'm Alison Bridger. I'm a solutions architect at Liberty Mutual. Uh, so Matthew was just talking about uh, rolling out well-architected reviews across the organization. And I'm going to focus a little deeper on well-architected for the team. Um, when I started working with the architecture team, building out some of these uh, supplemental documentation, documentation and, um, and working on the rollout, it was really important to us that um, this wasn't just another mandate um, coming down the pike from... Uh, architects and managers saying, you must do these reviews. There's a huge amount of value in doing these reviews for the engineers and the teams themselves. And so we really wanted to make sure that we focused on that as part of our rollout. And um, that, that's part of why we built out this uh, Liberty Mutual context documentation that Matthew was talking about. So anyway, I've participated, uh, most of the teams I work with are not only new to well-architected, but new to cloud development. So um, this is also uh, adds, adds another twist to the process. And um, I've participated now in, I think, four or five, I uh, facilitated four or five um, reviews and participated in a bunch, observed a bunch. And we've got a few findings that I just wanted to share with you. Um, that helps streamline the process. So first is um, the documentation itself. Ahead of all the reviews, we uh, shared not only the AWS pillar guidance, um, the white papers that Samir was talking about, and the um, Le Liberty Mutual documentation. We also encouraged uh, the team to go in and uh, create a workload in, in the uh, sandbox and play around and read, read up on the questions. So prior to the review, folks had an idea of what questions were going to be on there and had maybe given some thought already to how our workload um, matched up and where we have opportunity areas. Um, the second, my second bullet here is conversation over checkboxes. And I think Samir said exactly the same thing. Um, 
we really wanted to emphasize that this isn't just about checking a box on, on the form. And there's, we also didn't want it to be discouraging for some of our newer teams where there's not, some, some sections don't have any boxes checked. Um, this is meant to be, uh, we need to look at it as an opportunity for how we can improve our code and our applications, not as like an indictment of, oh no, this is, this is so bad, you didn't check any boxes. Um, and really the value of these reviews is in those conversations where um, the engineers come in and they can help identify where, where do we have risks, maybe um, risks that we haven't thought about by getting everyone's perspective and involvement, engagement, you really, are, you're gonna do a better job and it's gonna end up um, being more well-architected uh, at, at the end of the day. And uh, we also really use the tool in our reviews there to document um, our findings carefully and then go back and look at the findings and the notes we had to create um, stories and, and uh, backlog items for improvement. Um, the last two bullets I have here, engineer participation and um, inclusion of non-engineers are really about inclusivity. Uh, some squads I've talked to have, have limited their um, reviews to just like a principal engineer and an architect. And we felt that, that, that w that's maybe okay for a more mature team, but for a newer team, we really want, again, to have these conversations with all the engineers. Everyone contributes, um, everyone participates, and everyone helps to improve, um, improve the software. So, uh, we included all our engineers, and that really has led to this being, again, less like a mandate coming from above and more of a grassroots type of um, review. So, like, I facilitated uh, one review, and the second part of the review, the team said, we, we want to facilitate the next part. Uh, we're going to take over, which was really great. And the team broke into pairs, and each pair like took a, took one of the best practices to kind of delve into, and then report back. And I, I think you can't really ask for a better outcome than that. Um, the last bullet is including is inclusion of non-engineers. We included um, managers, uh, product designers, product owners, and scrum masters in these reviews because again, everyone has skin in the game here. Everyone has a stake in improving the software. And I think, uh, like for example, operational excellence, the product owners really have uh, a big part to play in those best practices. Um, also, you know, product owners are helping make decisions about prioritization. And a lot of what you're doing with these well-architected reviews is trying to figure out you know, we, we know we have risks here. How, how, how do we weigh the risks we have against the time it will take to fix it, against the features we want to implement? And so, you know, you can, you can implement all the features you want, but if, if your app isn't reliable or it's not performant and it falls over as soon as you have a heavy load, then it doesn't really matter. Those features are never going to see the light of day. So the product owners being included in these conversations is really helpful to to get these stories that we have in the backlog, get them prioritized and um, improve the software. So anyway, that's a, those are my four points. It's really documentation and preparation, um, conversations over checkboxes, and then inclusivity. Um, that's all I have, so I'll turn it over to Samir. Thanks, Allison and Matthew. Uh, next. Uh, Great job championing well architected for Liberty Mutual. Uh, next up is McDonald's, and, and Vamshi is going to talk to us about failure mode analysis using the well architected custom lenses. Over to you, Vamshi. Thanks, Abir. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vamshi Kumarwali. I'm a principal architect within the digital architecture team here at McDonald's. Our team primarily focuses on uh, designing and architecting different products and platforms that support the digital channels. A little bit of insight into uh, McDonald's. So we are the world's largest restaurant company with 40,000 restaurants across 100 plus countries, putting in almost 65 plus million uh, customers served on a daily basis. Now, to support this kind of a scale and complexity, we have a, a highly scalable cloud native digital platform that's made up of many different workloads. Uh, ranging from microservices, serverless functions, uh, as well as different batch jobs. 
Now, with reliability being one of our key objectives, we look at different ways in improving uh, resilience, and one of the, one of the techniques uh, we used is failure mode analysis. For those who are not familiar with failure mode analysis, the key idea of this process is to, to improve the resiliency of a system by identifying all the different points of failure and having building in some kind of a recovery mechanisms so that you are resilient to these failures. In our context, uh, our analysis was focused on three different kinds of workloads, a microservice, a Lambda function, and, and a batch application. Now let's understand from a workload standpoint, what causes a workload to fail? Right? Now a workload can fail either because of the failure in its internal components or maybe there is a failure in the external dependencies. Now when we look at the external dependencies, the way we have kind of uh, categorized them is into three different areas or three different failure domains. One of them is, let's say, third party or the partner APIs. Let's say you're a, a, a payment microservice and you're trying to make a payment, you would have a dependency on, a, say, a third party payment gateway. That becomes a point of failure for you to make sure that you are actually resilient to some of the failures uh, that would come from that particular API. Similarly, infrastructure services, right? Maybe your workload depends on a, a database or a messaging queue or a cache. That becomes another failure domain. You could also have another in, other internal workloads that you would depend on, uh, similar to your uh, current workload that you're working on, but it also has other dependencies. Now, the other key question we also wanted to ask is what is the business impact of this failure? Let's say this workload fails. What would it prevent our end users from doing? Would it not let, let our customers log in? Or in our context, would it not let uh, browse a menu of a particular restaurant? So now let's talk about how do we make these workload resilient to failures. There are uh, different techniques that would improve resilience. Uh, this is, again, not an exhaustive list. We kind of gave a few examples in here. We classified them into four different areas. If you look at it, uh, the first one is about fault tolerance, right? Fault tolerance gives the ability to your system where you continue to operate, even if one or two, uh, a few of the components in that, particular, uh, in that particular system fails. Some of the other techniques that you could employ uh, in here are like circuit breakers, where you want to avoid a cascading effect, or say you want to employ retries to handle with, tra uh, with transient errors. In some situations, it could be as simple as configuring timeouts, so they're able, able to re release your resources on a timely manner. One other example is, like, say, idempotency. Right? You want your APIs to be idempotent, so that even if a particular client retries it, you are able to <coughs> excuse me, you are able to continue with that API without having any side effects. Now, the second big area is about service configuration, which is configuring your infrastructure services for high availability. This could mean you have a multi-AZ setup or a multi-region setup based on your need. Having read replicas, for example, for your databases and cache. Uh, could be dead letter queues, so that you are able to uh, handle failures in your messaging infrastructure. Having point in time recovery, uh, so that you are able to go back in time. Uh, maybe there was a corrupted write. Uh, you want to restore to a, 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 a past time. You could, you, so some of all these are uh, things that you could do from a service configuration standpoint. Now, a couple other areas which are also important for resilient are reliability testing and monitoring. Yes, you have put in a lot of these uh, resilience mechanism in play, but you need to make sure that they are indeed actually working. So which is where we would put in a lot of best practices in play from a testing standpoint. Uh, things like chaos engineering, uh, testing out your backup restore procedures, or testing your failover mechanisms. Now, monitoring also plays a key role because you also want to detect uh, detect a failure, right? So here, some of the examples or best practices would fall in as having health checks at each individual workload level, monitoring your key SLAs and metrics, or monitoring your resources. Now we looked at how a workload could fail and what are the different resilience best practices that you could apply. So we wanted to have a structured approach so that we are able to analyze our workloads from different resilience best practices standpoint make sure that they are consistently being applied. We are able to do this on a, on a recurring basis, bring awareness to our developer community in terms of what these best practices are. So there were a lot of different uh, goals which we wanted to achieve with this analysis, and that is where we took help of custom lenses from War. Now, if you look at custom lenses, uh, we collated, uh, if you look at this chart, towards the leftmost, you would find our initial step, which is about preparatory phase, where we compiled a list of best practices these are many different best practices we have compiled with uh, internal teams, uh, AWS teams, or even our partners. Now, these best practices, we translated them into different custom lenses. 
Uh, we wrote a couple of Python functions to translate these. But if you look at the custom lenses, the first lens here uh, on the access box is about uh, failure impact, right? This lens essentially asks if a particular workload fails, what is the business impact? Now, the second lens here is about AWS services, right? Let's say your AWS services are failing. How does your workload be resilient to this? Maybe it is throwing a throttling exception, or maybe there is a uh, uh, server unavailable exception, right? How do you handle that kind of a, uh, exception in your particular workload? The third lens was about focusing on the partner services, where we want to see whether uh, your part are you resilient to your partner service failures. Similarly, four and five are something to do with our internal workloads. Now, the next step was, once we gathered all of this data, obviously we want to uh, look at this from a holistic standpoint to understand and to, uh, look at insights and reports on where do we stand from an overall resilient standpoint across all of these workloads, which is where we piped all of our data via S3 and Athena into QuickSight. And on QuickSight, we were able to generate different insights and metrics to look at what is our most important workload, or what level of the resilience do we are we there? What are our uh, important areas to improve? So after this uh, phase, we were able to get to a list of improvement areas. And, but that list of improvement areas, we need a mechanism to prioritize them so that we know that we are actually focusing on the most important ones, which is where we created a custom scoring mechanism. So if you look at our scoring mechanism, it kind of based off three different factors. The first one is probability of failure. What is the likelihood of that happening? Second is what is the impact of the failure? What business function it is impacting? And the third one is about what category of improvement. That kind of gave us an idea of what it takes for us to implement it. Then we scored it. We were able to get to a list of high-risk improvements, uh, which we then had our uh, product teams remediate each of, each of those issues. Here are a few example custom lenses. For example, if you look at the, the resilient lens for MSK, which is managed streaming for Kafka, in this screenshot, for example, if I talk about one of them, uh, we wanted to ensure that the topic replication factor is appropriately configured. Meaning if you are a two broker setup, or if your brokers are distributed into two different AZs, you want to make sure that your replication factor is configured to match the number of AZ replicas that you have. Similarly, if you look at Dynamo, as we know, eventually consistent reads provide better resilience compared to a strong consistency. So that was one of our resilience best practice we said. If a workload is able to use eventually consistent reads, that is what you would uh, encourage you to use it. All right, that was my part. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Vamshi. All right, so these are some of our other customers that I want to quickly talk about is Cox Automotive 988, uh, 1898 Moots. Uh, they've all implemented well architected and have seen great benefits coming out of it. Uh, you know, if you look at Cox, that was what I was talking about in terms of. Uh, secure internal investment to help reduce risk. So a lot of times when you're talking of these non-functional requirements that you need to implement, a lot of times we do get pushback saying those are great, but let's prioritize these features. And like Allison mentioned, that if your systems are not built well, then those features will never see the light of day. So uh, those are pretty critical in terms of how you use well-architected across your organization. Um, I do want to quickly highlight uh, some of the things around uh, well-architected has partners that come help build and implement well architected reviews for you, uh, build mechanisms across your organizations, um, and these are some of the benefits that you get. Um, you have better visibility, you have, um, you know, you avoid uh, costly architectural mess, right? Um, there are cases where we've seen people implementing backups, but in the same AZ as where their volume set first, and when the entire AZ is out, you've lost your backup, you've lost your thing, and this is pretty basic. Like most people I see are nodding, uh, yeah, we should do it, but trust me, the number of times these things happen is unbelievable, right? Where you're like, well, we should have had this conversation. No one talked about it. Uh, because the way we look at unit tests or integration tests and other things, right, when you look at code, there is no architectural test. No one's looking if you went from being single AZ to uh, multi AZ to single AZ. No one's looking at how you're deploying your software, right? Those things are not existent today. It's starting to build up, and well, architecture is a great way to start measuring some of those things. Um, at some point, maybe somebody writes a, a well-architected test uh, that, you know, if it doesn't pass, I'm not going to deploy. Uh, hopefully, someone does that. Uh, all right, now uh, the question I want to ask you is when we started, we talked about, you know, how do you tell your teams, are you well-architected, right? 
And I am hoping by this session you guys have a better idea to go have those conversations with your teams to say, are you well architected? Right? That's the conversation you need to have. Because if you're not having that conversation today, you're very focused on your code, you're very focused on how the tactical day-to-day -day things work, you're not looking at architectural health, you're not looking at building mechanisms, and as I pointed out earlier, uh, good intentions don't work. So, uh, cool. With that, uh, I do want to thank you all for taking the time. I know it's late in the day. Uh, I appreciate you coming here, and thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>